or right now, actually. Uh, cool. So today's talk is about creating data applications with Impala and Kudu. Uh, I'm Todd. I'm the founder of the Kudu project, an engineer at Cloudera. Um, I also want to thank Marcel Kornecker, who helped me put together these slides. He unfortunately couldn't be here today to co-present, so I'll be doing the whole thing. Uh, so I want to start off with a kind of review of the Hadoop architecture as a whole, looking at this ecosystem, um, sort of what are the different pieces and how Kudu and Impala fit in. So this is kind of a marketing slide, I apologize. But basically, uh, when you talk about Hadoop these days, we're not talking just about the core Apache Hadoop project. That's kind of the kernel and where this whole movement of, uh, of data tooling started. Uh, but actually, we're talking about a much larger ecosystem with a bunch of different components. And we can kind of group these components into different areas, like operations, data management, um, data processing, data storage, et cetera, different ways of looking at data, searching data, et cetera. Uh, so in this talk, we're talking mostly about relational data management. And uh, the components we'll be focusing on are the ones um, highlighted here in yellow. Uh, so SQL, particularly concentrating on Impala, uh, and then the different storage options, and mostly focusing on Kudu. Um, so we're not going to talk a whole lot about you know, Spark and um, streaming systems. A lot of those do integrate with Kudu, but that's not the focus of today's talk. So given that we're talking about relational data, uh, relational data is not new to the Hadoop ecosystem. Um, you can store this kind of data in many different storage options. And uh, traditionally, we had the two options you'll see on the left of this slide here. We had Hadoop HDFS, which was founded in around 2006, I think, 2007. Been around for quite some time now, maybe 10 years. And Apache HBase, uh, which was founded a couple of years later, maybe 2009, 2010, somewhere around there, or I think nine. Uh, and then the newest option, which we'll talk about today, is Kudu. Uh, so we have these three different options for storing data in Hadoop. And you can put data in any of them. You can query data in any of them. Um, so I want to talk about why you would choose one versus the other uh, for relational data, for relational data applications. So traditionally, if you're doing analytics in Hadoop, that means HDFS. HDFS was the original uh, storage option that we had. Um, and it's still very good for a lot of things. It's a very mature system. Uh, probably most people today, if they talk about uh, big data, a good portion of their data will be in Hadoop, in HDFS. And HDFS is good for a couple of reasons. For one, it's very, very flexible. HDFS is a file system. It's the Hadoop distributed file system. And that means you can put any type of file into it. You're not constrained in which formats you could use, which types of data. You could put video files. You could put relational data. You could put text. Uh, so it's super flexible. You can land any data from any source. And it's incredibly scalable, partially because it's so simple. It's just storing bytes. It doesn't care about the types of data. That makes it a simpler system to engineer. And it's able to scale to really large volumes. Uh, I think some other people in this conference are talking about you know, multi-tens of petabyte clusters that they're running with HDFS. And that's pretty normal, pretty within the range that's um, considered doable on HDFS. And also, due to simplicity, it's very high throughput. We're not trying to interpret the bytes as they land in HDFS. You just copy a file in. We take those bytes, land them on disk. And you get basically the raw throughput of the disk devices when you put data into HDFS or you read the data back out. Again, it's not doing much. It's just copying data from here to there. So it's very, very efficient. So that's, that's all the good things. What's the downside of HDFS is that because it doesn't understand the data you're putting into it, it doesn't give you a lot of interesting semantics. Basically, the only semantics it has are bulk insert a big file, read chunks of that file back out, uh, maybe stream them into some system that's doing SQL. You can't go and address an individual row or record. You can't update an individual row. Uh, and that's because it doesn't know what a row is. It doesn't know how to find that row. There's no built-in ideas of indexing, et cetera. Uh, so it's very good for these traditional batch applications. Not so good if you need to be able to go back and change your data, delete it, uh, or stream it in as it arrives. So a couple of years after HDFS was introduced, um, some folks got together and started building a system called HBase. And they were trying to solve some of these challenges around mutability in HDFS and kind of impose a little bit more structure. So they added this idea of a row key and rows and columns. So it looks a little bit more like a traditional database where you can address a particular piece of data saying, this row key, this particular column, I'd like to retrieve that or update it or delete it. Uh, and you get these richer semantics because of that. Uh, it's still pretty flexible, though. It doesn't require you to specify any schema up front. You can just put any data in. It just treats all the data as byte arrays. So you can still do you know, whatever data you want. Um, 
change your data on the fly. You don't need to kind of describe it ahead of time. So it retains some of that flexibility. And it adds this real-time data serving uh, component, where you can go and access any one of these rows or a small range of rows on the order of milliseconds, you know, thousands, millions of times per second. Um, still pretty scalable, so you can do these big data serving, scaling applications. Uh, maybe not quite as scalable as HDFS, and not quite as efficient as HDFS. In particular, if you're looking at doing analytics, like running a, a big SQL query, uh, pointing a BI tool at this, um, running machine learning using Spark, um, HBase is not going to be the most performant option. You'll find it's actually 10 to 100 times slower in certain cases versus the best formats on HDFS for those kind of use cases. So it was really built for this online serving, uh, online data access mutation kind of workload, not really built for relational analytics. So where does Kudu fit in? Kudu is trying to be in the middle between these two things. So HDFS is very good for these bulk ingest, uh, bulk read, but no, no mutations and no random access. HBase is good at the opposite. Kudu says, well, we can probably be pretty good at both. We're not going to be quite as good as HDFS in storage efficiency. We're not going to be quite as good as uh, HBase is at all this random access. But hey, we can find a happy medium, which will make building your applications, particularly relational applications, much, much easier. Uh, because you'll have very good performance and the ability to do the updates that you, you would probably require in a lot of different applications. So it simplifies your architecture. Uh, and it's really good for this category we call fast analytics on fast data. So fast analytics is what it sounds like, you know, running a BI app, running a Spark job to build a machine learning model, anything that's kind of looking at data in aggregate. And fast data means the data is not a static data set. It's something that actually may be streaming updates as they arrive from some other system. You may be modifying it as new data becomes available. So that's kind of the overview of where Kudu fits and the design goals of Kudu in this ecosystem. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about the other side, which is Apache Impala. How does that fit with Kudu for relational data applications? So Impala is a modern SQL engine for Hadoop. So it's open source. It's part of the Apache incubator, so it's part of the Apache Foundation. Uh, and it's been around for a couple of years, but in case anyone is not familiar yet, I'll give you the quick overview here. Basically, Impala is trying to take the, uh, the ideas from MPP, which is Massively Parallel Processing Databases. So think of traditional things like Teradata, Vertica, um, Aster Data. You know, there's, there's probably 10 or 15 of these that are relatively well known. And bring these ideas into the Hadoop ecosystem. So it's designed for very good performance. For these BI-type applications, you want very fast performance. And uh, Impala was written from scratch in C++ a couple years ago based on today's hardware and today's, uh, you know, the way to get the most performance out of today's hardware. But it's not just taking the old school relational database and re-implementing it. It's actually implementing it in this new context of the Hadoop ecosystem. So it's built to integrate with the rest of the components. So for example, when you uh, want to use Impala, your data could be stored in any of the Hadoop storage managers, meaning it could be data on HDFS, it could be data in HBase, and it could be data in Kudu now. Uh, and they'll still use the other components to do things like unified metadata. So all of the metadata is stored in the Hive Metastore. Uh, it still supports the same formats that you might put on HDFS. So it's very, very flexible. And it runs on the same nodes as HDFS. It's not like it's trying to export data into some MPP database and then import it back. It's actually running natively in the same cluster. Uh, so it's been around a number of years. It was first uh, released to the public about four and a half years ago. Uh, it's been 1.0 for several years, uh, very widely adopted. So it's become somewhat of an open source, open standard for this kind of uh, high performance MPP on Hadoop. Uh, so it's had millions of downloads. Among Cloudera's customers, at least, there's majority adoption. You know, far more than half of our customers use this in production. And it's certified with all the kind of standard BI tools you might expect to work with an MPP database. Uh, and it's also uh, shipped by multiple vendors. So Cloudera, Mapbar, and Oracle all ship some version of Impala. So if you're a user and you're using Impala, how does it appear to you? So the design here is that it appears just like any other database. So it works with your existing BI tools. Your ever, average analyst is probably not like SSHing in and running a shell. Uh, they're probably pointing you know, click view or um, microstrategy, something like that, at this cluster and using a standard protocol like JDBC or ODBC to run SQL queries. So the SQL uh, standard is SQL 92 uh, plus some of the later extensions. So pretty much anything you can do in a 
that kind of standard SQL database, you can do an Impala. Um, things like all the standard data types, uh, subqueries, UDFs, UDAs. Um, not too exciting. Pretty much everything you expect should work will work without any changes. And we support all of the kind of security things as well that you'd expect from a relational database. So you can grant and revoke on columns and tables. You can authenticate uh, using LDAP. Um, everything you'd expect from an enterprise-grade database is available with Impala. Um, so I guess from a, a user perspective, Impala is not interesting. It's sort of interesting because it's not interesting. It just works like you expect. There's nothing special you have to learn to move a workload onto Impala. Uh, so I mentioned a couple times that Impala is meant to be the highest performance SQL on Hadoop. And here's some numbers from a benchmark that was published in April, just a couple months ago. This is comparing TBC-DS, which is it's called a decision support benchmark. Uh, basically, it's a bunch of different tables in a kind of snowflake schema. It does these very complicated queries involving joins, uh, group buys. Uh, I think there's some windowed aggregate queries as well, um, using most of the, the SQL standard, uh, fairly complicated real-life modeled queries. And this is comparing a number of different engines. Uh, so Impala, Greenplum, which has um, been around for a while, MPP database, not in the Hadoop space. Uh, Spark SQL, Hive with LLAP, and Presto. And smaller bars here are better. This is the number of elapsed seconds. And you can see here that uh, the, across the benchmark, Impala is performing the best across all these, and it, in some cases by a pretty wide margin. Um, so I think it's about 15 to 20x faster than Presto, for example. And these are also the latest versions as of April when the benchmark was run. Uh, you can check out the blog post for all the details on the experimental setup and reproduction code, et cetera. Uh, so that previous benchmark was what we call a single user benchmark, where we have the data set and we run through all of the queries one by one as if there's one user using the system. A more realistic benchmark is a multi-user uh, benchmark, where you actually can imagine you've got you know, 20 or 30 or even 200 BI users who come in to work in the morning. Uh, they get their coffee, they go to their computer and fire up all the dashboards and start clicking through, understanding what's going on with the data. Uh, so in that case, you don't have one neat and tidy stream of query one, query two, query three. You actually have many different threads that are all competing for resources. And in this multi-user scenario, uh, the advantage of Impala is even more stark. Uh, so you can see here that uh, higher is better in this case. This is aggregate queries per hour completed. And Impala is far better than something like LLAP uh, on this workload. So between um, maybe six times better for four concurrent users and 20 times better for 16 concurrent users. So this is kind of more realistic for the target workloads we're talking about for business intelligence and kind of uh, online applications where you're trying to analyze data in real time with real consumers uh, issuing a highly concurrent workload. Uh, so now back to Kudu a little bit. I wanted to talk more specifically about how you use Kudu. In the first section of the talk, I talked about where it kind of fits in and the design goals. Uh, this is more specific implementation details. So our elevator pitch for Kudu is that it's scalable, fast, and fault tolerant, uh, tabular storage. So these are some of the, the same characteristics you see in all of the Hadoop components. Scalability, currently we've tested around 300 nodes. Uh, Comcast gave a presentation at the Strata conference a couple months ago uh, talking about their cluster, which I think is 300 or 400 nodes, something like that. You can go find the slides online. Uh, the design is to scale into thousands of nodes. Um, it doesn't mean that we have tried it and it didn't work. This just means that we haven't currently done testing at that scale. The architecture is designed to support multi-thousand node clusters with tens of petabytes of data. Uh, so there's no doubt in my mind we will get there in the next couple of years. In terms of speed, again, for these kind of workloads, performance is important. There's often a user waiting on the other end of an application. Uh, or the speed with which you can refresh your machine learning models is really important for the best accuracy and the best results in production. Uh, so we want to take full advantage of the hardware. And uh, Kudu, like Impala, was written from scratch in C++ uh, relatively recently, meaning we were taking advantage of the current ways that CPUs are optimized and continuing to progress. Uh, so very concurrent, very low lock contention, things like that to scale to many cores, and large amounts of RAM. So we expect to do millions of reads or writes per second uh, on the cluster. And any individual node should give throughput that is commensurate with the hardware capability of that node. So that means if you put a really fast flash device that gives you one gigabyte per second of read throughput, uh, Kudu should be able to read that data at that kind of native speed. We're not going to have CPU overhead getting in the way, preventing us from getting everything out of your hardware. 
If you pay for the hardware, you expect to get the performance you paid for. And the third point here is tabular. So this is a very important point of this presentation. Kudu is a tabular relational store. It's not a file system. We're not trying to compete with HDFS for file system duties. When you create data in Kudu, it has to be in the form of tables. There's no concept of a file or a block or a blob. Uh, everything is tables in Kudu. So when you create these tables, it's sort of like creating tables in a relational database. Uh, you can have rows, and you could have hundreds of billions or trillions of rows, and you get individual record level access. So you can go and update, insert, delete individual rows, just like any other database. So when you create a table in Kudu, how do you specify what that table should look like? Well, we basically borrowed the ideas from SQL here. When you create a table, you specify which columns you have. Uh, this is unlike HBase or Cassandra, for example where you can kind of on the fly just insert data into columns and they appear um, kind of as you ask for them. In Kudu, you actually say, here's my table. My create table statement says I have 45 columns. And these columns have these names and these types. And these ones are nullable. These ones are not nullable. So it looks very much like Postgres or Oracle or any other database. Uh, the data types we support, pretty much the standard simple data types. We don't currently support nested types. Uh, but that's probably something we'll do in the next couple of years, depending on demand. Um, and another important distinction here of Kudu versus something like HBase or Cassandra is that the primary key is actually made up of a subset of your normal columns. So again, just like a relational table, you say I've got 10 columns, um, and I'm going to make the primary key be the email address column. Same with Kudu. It's not like some special row key concept that has different semantics that you have to manually understand or encode. Uh, you just specify which columns make up your key, and we'll take care of the rest. Of course, a, another important point here is that with big data, uh, your data will change over time. You'll have this huge data set, and then you'll decide one day to start collecting some new attribute about this data. So you need to alter table, add column. And we support doing that in essentially a constant time, very fast operation. So even if you've previously stored billions or trillions of rows, you do alter table add column or drop column, and that's a constant time, very fast operation. Very important for a big data application. So once you've created this table, uh, you need to access it. And we basically have two main paths people will access. The first is to say, well, I just want a NoSQL database. I want to think about this in the same way I think about a NoSQL store, and I want to use APIs. So we have Java, Python, and C++ APIs. And those have very, very low latency. They're directly accessing the servers that store the data, uh, getting response usually in the low uh, number of milliseconds, you know, three to five milliseconds, high percentile latencies. So these are great if you have an online application that really needs the, the lowest possible latencies and has pretty simple access patterns, like update this row, go scan this row, or this range of rows. But if you want anything complicated, like a, a SQL query or machine learning model or anything like that, you're not going to use the API by hand, most likely. Instead, you're going to want to use something like SQL. Uh, so we offer SQL only through integrations. So Kudu itself, natively, only has an API. And if you want to issue some kind of a query with a join or a group by aggregate, you have to go through one of these integrations. Uh, so then you'd use, in this talk, we're talking mostly about Impala. You'd issue your SQL command to Impala, and Impala would be responsible for translating that into the underlying API calls to access Kudu in the most efficient manner it can. So I want to talk a bit about one of the main features that Kudu has for particularly time series applications. Uh, this talk is about real time applications, and time series and real time often go hand in hand. And uh, we'll talk a lot about physical schema design. So this is when I'm setting up my application, how do I create the table in Kudu in such a way that I get the best performance uh, that I can? So first, what is time series? We're using this term. It's kind of a vague term. Uh, I'm going to define it in a vague way as well. Anything where you're usefully, usefully partitioning and querying data based on time. So pretty much anything with a timestamp column, you can think of as a time series. So it might be as simple as here's a sensor and a temperature reading at each different time over the last you know, hours, taken every millisecond. Uh, it could be your transaction table from an online retail uh, application where at this timestamp, this user purchased this item. Uh, we'll think of all these things as time series. Obviously, finance is another very easy example. You have ticks of particular stocks, the timestamps, you be able to ask uh, price, et cetera. Uh, so pretty wide area, uh, but I think these patterns will actually apply for any of these kind of applications. 
So why is Kudu good for time series data? Why would you pick Kudu over some other option? Uh, a couple of different points here. The main thing about time series data is that real-time data ingestion is very important. You don't want to have time series where you bulk load it once every morning, uh, because then you can't react. The real value in a lot of these applications is around quickly reacting to the changes in the things that you're observing, whether it's updating a model or being able to build a real-time dashboard to understand if something is going wrong with your, your site or your operations, et cetera. Uh, so Kudu's real-time ingest is very, very important. But it's also usually a big data application, and it's important to be very dense on disk. Um, so Kudu has these concepts of column encodings and compressions, which are optimized for time series. So we won't have time in this talk to go through the details, but basically when we encode data in Kudu and store it on disk, it's done in a way that's incredibly compact for particular time series applications. So when you have a measurement that's changing only slowly over time, we'll encode only the deltas between different values, which tend to be very small. And then we can use these different techniques to bit pack those down into a very small number of bits and compress them before they hit disk. So you're able to get a lot of data into a smaller number of nodes. And then when you run a query, we're able to process that query much more quickly because we're reading so much, uh, so much less data off disk because of the compression. Uh, so the second point here is about partitioning. So when you have these kind of data sets that are always accumulating over time and often associated with some entity, so I gave the example of um, you have different sensors in your factory, and each sensor is taking a reading every 10 milliseconds, and you want to be able to query what happened to this sensor or what happened in this time range across all my sensors. So you're slicing and dicing on entities and on time ranges. And the way that Kudu partitioning works, which we'll talk more about in the next slides, is that you can actually do both of these things. You can slice on time ranges and on the particular entities or other attributes that are important for your query workload. And once you've partitioned your data across all these different uh, partitions in your cluster, all of your queries can then be parallelized across that. So when you do a scan saying, I'd like to aggregate all the information over the last uh, seven days, you're able to work, uh, uh, farm that work out to all these different worker nodes and parallelize that and get a very fast response. And the last point, which is kind of obvious in this kind of big data ecosystem, it scales out. So it's obvious in, in this ecosystem of Hadoop, but if you compare to a lot of traditional time series databases, a lot of them are single node solutions. They don't really scale out to hundreds or thousands of nodes. So the fact that you can keep on adding more nodes to your cluster uh, over time and handle more data or faster responses is a key thing for time series use cases. So I want to talk about partitioning schemes. Um, so it might be a little bit small to read in the back, uh, but basically in this, um, in this diagram we have two axes. So the top axis says hash. So you can imagine we've got this factory with a bunch of different sensors, and uh, we've taken all of our sensors and we've grouped them into three groups. We'll call them uh, bucket one, which will be this column, bucket two, which is this column, and bucket three. And the way this works is you specify hash partition on sensor ID uh, into three buckets. You just do this declaratively when you create the table. And Kudu internally is taking the hash code of this ID and modulo by the number of buckets. So for any particular piece of data, we can determine which of these three buckets that data arrives into. Uh, and then the other dimension here is the time dimension. So this top row is the May 7th, uh, May 7th partition. And this row is all of May 8th. And this row is all of May 9th and May 10th. Uh, so the idea here, for any piece of data, we can figure out which time range, which tells us which row of this diagram, and which sensor, which tells us a column. And this locates us into a particular partition that that piece of data falls into. And this is all specified declaratively when you create the table. And then as you insert data, Kudu is automatically routing your, your rows to the correct partition based on these rules that you described. And then when you query data, uh, we're able to particularly route that query to the partitions that may have applicable data. So we can see here that typically in inserts, or typically in time series applications, your inserts are for the current time. You, know, you might occasionally collect some back data that arrived late, but most of the data is about timestamp, which is now. So all of that data will be landing in this bottom row because this is the current date, right? So these three partitions are hot accepting inserts. And this is good. In particular, notice that it's not just one partition. So some other data stores only support range partitioning. And if they don't have any hash partition component, 
that means all of your inserts will direct to the same one partition for the current time. And that one host is shouldering your entire insert workload. It's a phenomenon usually called hotspotting. And this is a really big problem when you're trying to design these time series workloads on range partition stores. But with Kudu, since we also hash partition, we're able to spread it out across three different buckets, or as many buckets as you like, and get parallelism on the inserts. And then on scans, imagine we want to collect all of the data historically about one particular sensor. If you specify that predicate, where sensor ID equals you know, one, two, three, Kudu internally will figure out and optimize this query so it only queries this particular bucket. It is able to eliminate most of the data without even reading it and gives you much faster response time. Uh, so just to kind of wrap up that section, the idea here is that because you can specify declaratively how you partition, and because the partitioning can be flexible on both time dimensions and hashing on different attributes of the data, you're able to very carefully control how the data is laid out in your cluster and optimize that based on the workload that you have in your application. Uh, so we've sort of gone back and forth talking what's Kudu, what's Impala. Let's talk about how they fit together now. Uh, they fit just like these two sheeps or whatever they are. So step back a little bit and talk a little bit about database management in general. So if you look at any traditional database management system, like say Postgres, and you delve into the source code, you'll find it's actually not one big thing. It's a bunch of different components that are engineered to work together, kind of modules in the source. And the main components we see here is that it has a query execution, record layer, storage, and a catalog. Uh, so to break down what these components are, storage is basically how is the data actually laid out onto disk. So you have things like block caches and page management and B trees and indexes, things like that. Record layer is saying, I've got this data on disk. I've retrieved this particular block from disk. How am I going to actually interpret this block as rows and columns instead of just bytes? Then query execution is things like, I've taken in this select statement. I want to parse it. I want to understand what the user meant, uh, develop a query plan, and then execute that plan across the cluster and you know, actually determine the results and send them back to the user. And then the third item is the catalog, which is metadata. Uh, so which tables exist? When I get this query that references a particular table, how does that map to my underlying storage so I know which data to read? So in a system like Postgres, we have all these components, but they're all tightly coupled together. You can't just use the Postgres uh, query execution with nothing else underneath it. You have to kind of get everything together. The idea in Hadoop is to take all these components and just separate them a little bit. Uh, so we have all the same components, but they're actually delivered as separate open source packages in a lot of cases. So Impala is taking the place of query execution. It's taking queries in, parsing them, planning them, doing that work. Kudu doesn't have to know anything about SQL. We have no SQL parser as part of Kudu. We've taken just the record and storage layers. So we'll store data and tell Impala how that maps into records. And then the Hive Metastore is the catalog. It's providing this unified view of which data exists, uh, who has access to it, et cetera. And then another option here, instead of using Kudu, you could use HDFS and Parquet. So here's an example where we actually split. HDFS is just storage. It doesn't understand rows and columns. Parquet is a format, but doesn't know how to store itself. It doesn't know about disks and drives. Uh, and you put them together, and they kind of make up this record storage abstraction. So you can see this mix and match capability. When you put them all back together, you get a database management system. Uh, so why would this be a good idea to take this database and split it up? It's basically about flexibility. So when we decouple everything, we get this mix and match capability. So let's say you've got all your data in uh, Kudu, and you want to run SQL. Great, you can point Impala at your Kudu data and run your SQL queries. And then somebody else turns around, they want to build a k-means cluster model over this table. They just take Spark and run it against Kudu. You didn't need to move any data. You didn't need to export and import. You just point a different access mechanism at the same storage layer. And then you've got some application developer who says, hey, I really want to do really quick lookups and updates based on some streaming data that's coming in. And they can just use a NoSQL API to access the data as well. They're not forced through the SQL layer. So that's mixing and matching the access. And you can also mix and match storage managers. So you might come to this talk and get excited about Kudu, but you say, hey, I've also got this other data set we've had for a long time. It's in Parquet. It's on HDFS. I don't want to migrate it. It works fine. And that's fine, too. So you can have your one Impala query and actually join data that might be stored in HDFS and on Kudu in the same query, 
uh, through your BI tool, and you don't need to know that there's different storage underneath. It's all kind of been unified through the SQL view and the common catalog of Hive. Uh, so you can see here this, the syntax. There's nothing special about the syntax. One table is on HDFS, one table is on Kudu. Nothing different about it. And this means that you can provide the same SQL support. Uh, so a kind of interesting anecdote. When we started prototyping and building Kudu a couple years back, uh, I had a demo of Tableau running on Kudu about two years before Tableau ever heard of Kudu. And that's a pretty nice thing. It's just speaking SQL, and Paula is in charge of doing that translation of SQL into something that Kudu can understand. So just to run through a couple of pieces of syntax, I'm not going to bore you and read out the actual syntax. But basically the idea is if you want to create stuff in Kudu, you can use Impala to do all of the same things that you could do through the API. So when you want to create a table, maybe for a time series, you issue a create table statement, uh, and you issue this partitioning scheme uh, syntax here, saying I want to partition by hash on this metric, and I want to range, uh, range partition on the timestamp with these particular values. And then this last bit, stored as Kudu, is telling Impala, go create this table in Kudu. You don't need to learn the API or anything like that. Same deal with select. It's the standard select. Every feature you get in Impala, you get with Impala on Kudu. So you can do all the analytic window functions, joins, aggregations, et cetera. Uh, but Impala has been optimized so that it'll take advantage of all the features that Kudu, opt uh, Kudu offers. So for example, uh, in this query down here, we have a where clause that restricts on timestamp, hostname, and metric. And if we do an explain in, in Impala, which tells it to dump its query plan out to the console, uh, you can see here that it's taking your predicates and group them into two different groups, the predicates and the Kudu predicates. So Kudu predicates are ones that Kudu can understand natively. So here, these are simple comparison predicates, and Kudu is able to use these to do things I mentioned earlier, like restrict which partitions might actually be accessed, and push it all the way down to the storage and evaluate it using indexes, things like that. And then this predicate is a, a suffix query, a host name like with some suffix match. And Kudu doesn't understand that kind of uh, predicate yet. Can't do anything smart with it. So that will be left on the Impala side to evaluate. So this basically means that we get very, very efficient uh, query execution. As efficient as if you wrote by hand all the, the APIs you need to do, uh, but it's doing it for you automatically on any arbitrary query. And then people often ask, isn't this going to be slow or transferring data between two different systems? We've actually designed the two systems to use the same common in-memory representation. So when we're transferring data, there's not a lot of uh, conversion or reinterpretation overhead. It's just kind of like a mem copy between two different buffers. Uh, it's very, very fast. Uh, a couple other examples here. Insert looks just like insert in any other database. You could use insert values clauses. You could use insert select to move data from one to another. You could use create table as select to transform between a HDFS table and a Kudu table, for example. Uh, very easy to use. Um, same with update. Uh, people often think of Hadoop as not updatable. You can just run an update query against the Kudu table, and it'll just work. Right? There's nothing special you have to do. You don't need to worry about swapping partitions or refresh metadata, anything like that. Um, the query plan, you can go look at these slides later if you want to understand the details of how this works. Same goes for delete. Uh, and you can do arbitrarily complex things here. So you can do delete queries that have subqueries. So for example, I want to delete from one table based on another table using this join. So anything uh, that the host info table says is in the East Coast, I'm going to delete all the metrics from the metrics table where that matches. So you can do these kind of things very easily versus having to write any program that will go through and do this. Uh, to wrap up a little bit, we'll talk a bit about uh, application architectures, just kind of giving the overview of how we think this will change the way you build applications in the Hadoop ecosystem. So real-time applications, what does that mean? I think the, the three points here that are very important, one is that it's continuously loading data. It's not like there's a data loading window once a day. Uh, you're streaming it in from some system, maybe like Kafka or Flume, et cetera. So that's all the time. The second is that as that data arrives, you want it to be visible with minimal delay. So immediately you can run a query and it reflects the data that arrived one second ago or one millisecond ago. And you want very consistent semantics. You don't want to see something where the data arrives and you see it in a query, and then you run another query, and it disappeared, and you run a third query, and it comes back. Uh, these things sound kind of obvious, but if you try to engineer these kind of systems on today's Hadoop, it becomes very, very, very complicated to do on HDFS. It's very easy to do with Kudu. So traditionally, if you built this on HDFS, 
And you can go find a blog post titled How to Build Real-Time Applications Without Kudu. Uh, it's got like this 27-step guide for how to do this complicated thing where you're swapping partitions and the metadata and creating new ones and compacting small files into big. And pretty much no one can implement this right unless you have a very, very strong tech team. And even then, it's very painful to implement right. Uh, you end up on call having to go back and deal with things. So in this architecture, basically people end up building something like Kafka, streaming some sort of a data format like Avro that can be written in a streaming fashion onto HDFS, periodically compacting that file into Parquet because Parquet is faster to read, and then waiting for that Parquet file to be available, inserting it into the Hive Metastore as a new partition, and then periodically coming back and compacting the small partitions into big partitions. So you end up with this very high latency of data ingest, where new data arrives, but it's not actually visible for uh, another couple of minutes. I'm getting a signal I should speed up. So just to quickly wrap up, uh, with Impala and Kudu, this is a lot simpler. You basically have all of your historical and real-time data in the same place. Uh, data arrives, you just insert it, you run a query, it's there. There's no management, there's no multiple systems interacting here. And to compare versus uh, MPP data warehouses, kind of the inspiration for all of this, there are some commonalities, like we can do all of the arbitrary SQL you're used to. You can insert, update, and delete. Uh, I think areas were better. We can do streaming inserts much better than your average uh, MPP data warehouse, and much better Hadoop integration. The downside, we're not good at some of the really old school bulk load type scenarios where you do get a bulk load once a day. We're working on improving that over time. Just to summarize, uh, Kudu and Impala together provide something that approaches the same capabilities as RDBMS. Uh, much simplified architecture compared to what you see in Hadoop today without Kudu. And you get all the same flexibility of a decoupled architecture that you see in Hadoop. So this is a very high performance architecture with the kind of best of both worlds. Hadoop's flexibility and MPP's usability. Uh, plus all the scalability of a big data ecosystem. Uh, so I want to wrap up because I got the signal from the back. I don't know if we have time for questions or not. Uh, anybody back there want to let me know? Nobody's saying no, so I'll take a couple questions. Yeah. Uh, the question is, can you do a full scan on all of the data? You can. It will be slow, uh, especially if you do it from a single client. That will be linearly that one client downloading your whole table. But if you use something like Impala, it will parallelize across all the machines, and it can be pretty fast. Yeah? Uh, sorry? The column level security? Uh, so security right now is um, in progress. There's various pieces. We have authentication via Kerberos is integrated but we don't have column level security on Kudu yet. Uh, it's coming pretty soon. We do have um, an Impala column level security that's been baked in for a long time. Yeah? Uh, two questions. How are you on uh, sparse data compared to HDFS? And the other is, what's a reasonable upper limit on the number of columns in the table? Uh, so the question is the sparse data and number of columns. Uh, we don't do that great with sparse data. We're more centered towards relational kind of tables where you have um, you know, a well-known number of columns and you know what they are. Uh, the maximum we support is 300 columns currently. Uh, so it's really not meant for these super sparse, you know, graph stores like you might use in HBase or Cassandra with thousands of columns. Um, I'll take one more and then I think we should wrap up. Yeah. What's the benchmark uh, difference between faults with uh, your Kudu and with HDFS? Okay. And the bulk update versus bulk. Yeah. So the question is uh, bulk performance for bulk insert into Kudu versus HDFS. Uh, significantly slower. So we've seen between five and ten times slower in certain cases. Um, if you're able to insert in ascending primary key order, it's not that much slower. But if you're inserting in a somewhat random order, we're essentially sorting your data. So it's going to be probably orders of magnitude slower in that case. So it kind of depends on the application. Um, bulk update, uh, same thing. If you can do it in a well-defined order, it'll be better. If you do it in a random order, it'll be fairly slow. Uh, I think we should wrap up so the next person can get set up. Uh, I'll stick around in case there are any further questions outside here. And uh, I'll be at the Cloudera booth following this as well if there are more questions. Thanks.